Gamera, Guardian of the Universe, is just as refreshing today as it was over two decades ago. While it gets credit for being one of the greatest reboots in the history of cinema, that doesn't entirely convey just how big of a deal this film is or was. Too many people put it and its sequels on the same level as the Versus series Godzilla installments or view it as just another giant monster movie, which accomplishes two things, neither of them desirable. It discredits what director Shusuke Kaneko and his team accomplished and it gives other films more credit than they deserve. So let's take a look at what makes this film the gem it is. Prior to its March 11, 1995 release, Japanese giant monster cinema had been in a sad state for quite some time. Most of the features of the 1970s, while often entertaining, were the output of cash-strapped and burnout skeleton crews that relied heavily on worn-out alien invasion narratives. Much of this due to the terrible state of the Japanese film industry at the time. 1984's The Return of Godzilla and 1989's Godzilla vs. Biollante, ambitious new takes with far more money at their disposal, suggested brighter days were ahead. However, the disappointing returns of the pair sent the genre in a different direction. The remaining Versus series Godzilla features, released between 1991 and 1995, were defined by the declining quality of their special effects, lazy repurposing of classic characters and iconography, bland direction, writing which felt like it never made it past the first draft, and blatant pandering to the latest trends or popular Hollywood productions. And Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, which hit Japanese theaters in December 1994 and was met with mixed to negative reviews, was the freshest thing on the mind when it came to Kaiju Ega. The Guardian of the Universe was cut from a different cloth, managing to sweep up prestigious accolades, attract international attention, and remains one of the few critically acclaimed giant monster movies. While Shusuke Kaneko's more than capable direction and Shinji Higuchi's effects wizardry were vital components in making this outstanding film, Kazunori Ito deserves an equal amount of credit. Ito, an accomplished writer with several beloved titles under his belt, is best known for the exploration of weighty philosophical ideas in science fiction titles like 1995's Ghost in the Shell, and he treats Gamera in a somewhat similar fashion, a blessing to a genre that at the time desperately needed at least a semblance of thought. In a time where Godzilla films were overloaded with vapid characters only good for commentating on monster fights or killing time between said fights, Gamera Guardian of the Universe offered a sense of humanity and thoughtfulness that had been largely unseen since the 60s and rarely seen since. The cast is just as big as it needs to be. There's the Kuzanagi family, which includes Naoya, the father in charge of investigating the drifting atoll, and Asagi, his daughter who becomes the priestess of Gamera. There's Nagamine, the intrepid heroine who quickly becomes the resident Gauss expert and must continually stand firm against incompetent bureaucracy. And there's Yanomori, the Coast Guard officer with a heart of gold. In addition, you have the colorful supporting cast consisting of Inspector Osako, the stubborn military and government officials, the taxi driver, and Nagamine's junior. It's refreshing to have well-realized, memorable characters who remain active or relevant throughout a modern Japanese giant monster movie. Take for instance the relationship between Nagamine and Yanomori. This could have easily come across as forced or a waste of time. Don't get me wrong, it isn't perfect, though their relationship never distracts or detracts from the narrative. It complements. She catches his attention early on, but he has to work to win her over. There's a scene where he expresses disappointment about her not keeping him involved, and Naoya makes some jokes at his expense. But after saving Nagamine's life, the two become tight-knit partners with a light romantic touch. Quiet development like this is neat and their relationship keeps all the core characters linked. When he tells her this, it feels earned. The Kuzanagi relationship is another great example. Naoya, the workaholic father, spends a large chunk of the film away from his daughter. She raises this point early in the film and her comments go over his head. Though, right before the final battle, Naoya goes to check on his injured daughter in her room and glances around the room while there. In doing so, he realizes just how disconnected he has been. Disconnected to the point where he was unaware his daughter might have a boyfriend. It's a minor thing, but it means a lot, even more so when his support for her helps save the day in the end. Nagamine has to be convinced to join the Gauss management team and once there, fight in order to be taken seriously. She initially refuses the request as she wants time to grieve her mentor and because how overwhelming her first steps into the unprecedented situation had already been, but she proves capable and determined to see the fight through to the end, even if it means butting heads with short-sighted government and military officials who allow the situation to spiral out of control. However, she stands her ground and they eventually own up to their mistakes. 
Finally, consider the implicative manner in which the film reveals information about Gamera and Asagi. Asagi, who we see is big into fantasy and science fiction, via her conversations and decorations in her room, has the least qualms about accepting the insanity happening around her. She assures the audience that Gamera is acting in the best interest of humanity, and the film reaffirms it with Gamera's actions. And while Gamera does not go out of his way to harm anyone, he doesn't go out of his way to rescue anyone either until after his connection with Asagi is formed. Also, before verbal confirmation of this connection, the film visually hints at it with Asagi's wounds following Gamera's injuries. There's also interest in the world outside of how to bring the monsters together. The simple existence of these creatures puts the nation into a state of shock and viewers get to see how it impacts everyday life. There are evacuations, the stock market crashes, the price of fish skyrockets, kings chatter about the news in class, and there's a lot of red tape the JSDF has to deal with before a single shot is fired. Civilians discuss the monsters and read newspapers about their attacks while riding on public transportation, wondering if the chaos will find its way to Tokyo. These same civilians become victims of the Gauss when it arrives in Tokyo later in the film. What were the Godzilla films of the time preoccupied with? Trying to sell Godzilla as a misunderstood, mistreated victim while glossing over how he was the common denominator of almost all the problems in his films and relishing in the wanton destruction he was causing without a second thought about the consequences. The films have little regard for the greater world. Their obligatory romances, in which lovers are kept apart much of the runtime, fall flat because they imply a deeper connection that was never established and whatever other interesting ideas that exist were usually sidelined after the first act. Put simply, rubbish. Meanwhile, the revamped origins of Gambra and Gauss provide room for ecological subtext. There are parallels between ancient civilization and the modern world, speculation that the people of the present are repeating the mistakes of the past. If humanity continues with its recklessness, its maltreatment of the environment, the shadow of evil will rise again to extinguish the fire of the human race. Yet there is still a chance for the living to change course. This environmentalism is raised a few times throughout the film and reiterated in the final minutes without it feeling too preachy. And Ito's tight writing is aided by Kaneko's direction. You know something has gone incredibly right when a filmmaker manages to sell the premise of a giant flying turtle. Unlike the aimlessness of its contemporary competition, Guardian of the Universe has a sense of purpose, personality, and is populated by delightful actors engaged with the material. The film starts as a mystery and gradually evolves into a race against time, masterfully juggling light humor and tension throughout and moving at exactly the right pace. And thanks to the care and attention given to both the humans and monsters, you have one of the more balanced monster films to date. On to the monsters. Viewers learn about the monsters as the characters do, and the monsters are constantly surprising the viewers with new tricks, allowing the stakes to be organically raised over the course of the film. This and the swift pacing prevents the film from getting stale. Gauss balloons from a meager size, not much larger than a man, to the titanic stature of Gamera, and this is when the government decides that enough is enough. Gauss overcomes its nocturnal limitations, becoming a fully functioning entity in the daylight and taking away the only advantage humans had over it. Think about the first time you learned Gamera could fire bursts of plasma, or could fly. Big moments, right? And there's a narrative reason for the delayed reveals. Gamera is regaining his energy. Even the spectacle is on another level. Of course it isn't perfect, there are a few less than ideal composite shots and digital moments, though overall, Guardian of the Universe has some of the most consistently impressive and creative action of the genre. It frames its colossal titan from low angles and the perspective of the immaculately detailed miniatures, producing interesting compositions and selling the size of these immense beasts. When it comes to mat shots, the monsters also appear to exist within the same physical space of their environment. Gamera is properly lit here and the world reacts to his presence. In the competing films, there's an embarrassing lack of attention to detail. In these moments, the lighting and the matte shots don't match, and the world seems oblivious to Godzilla's existence. And notice how the debris hits an invisible wall and bounces back or never crosses a certain threshold. Or check out this from 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Look at the obvious lackluster explosions pasted onto location footage. That's without mentioning the often uninspired shot composition, failure to disguise the fact that action takes place on sets, and little regard for pacing or dramatic structure. Monster battles will only entertain for so long unless you're doing something truly special or there are other interesting things happening. So the battles of Guardian of the Universe emphasize speed and excitement. Climatic showdown in Tokyo between Gamera and Gauss lasts about 10 minutes over and done. It allows the effects team to polish what little they have instead of overstretching their time and resources. Quality over quantity. But the entirety of the last act in Godzilla vs. Mothra, over 40 minutes, as characters standing around watching the monsters. The action normally isn't visually interesting or edited in any compelling way, and the less said about the physical bits, 
which consists mostly of bumping and odd physics, or their attempts at tension, the better. Giant monster cinema seems to be an inherently limiting genre when it comes to developing worthwhile stories or characters, and the best films are generally the ones that eschew the genre trappings as much as possible. Yet, even with the goal of making quality and mature-minded cinema, Guardian of the Universe embraces the traditional giant monster movie form. Gauss making Tokyo Tower its nest and the rescue on the bridge recalls moments from 1961's Mothra. The early island carnage and hillside gauss reveal evokes memories of Odo Island from the original Godzilla film. Or is there any surprise that Yonamori has naval ties? And consider this. Bet you never noticed any of this. These are all films by someone Kaneko admired greatly. Director Ishiro Honda, the director of the original Godzilla film and many of the early Showa films. Kaneko even sneaks in what seems to be a reference to Jurassic Park. Put simply, there's a fondness for the past, but it's not obtrusive. It's quick, different enough, and fits naturally into the new story. I don't mean to imply this film is perfect. A bit more development for his characters wouldn't have hurt, and there are a few questionable effects moments, but it's easily one of the best giant monster films. The best of the modern examples if you remove other titles like Shin Godzilla and Revenge of Iris, and it's a legitimately good film that has the ability to appeal to non-kaiju fans, because truth be told, kaiju fans can be overly tolerant of the many problems these films have. But Guardian of the Universe is an example of how stories, human characters, and giant monsters do not have to be at odds. The elements can and should work together. When the human characters are viewed as more than tools to set up battles, it can go a long way in making engaging films and something worth revisiting long after the special effects aren't as novel as they once were. Monsters in and of themselves only go so far. They get boring fast without something to back them up, be it well executed themes or worthwhile characters. But even then, as Higuchi demonstrates here, there's also an art form to rubber suits and miniature cities. Like anything else in the visual medium, creative camera work, lighting, and editing can make all of the difference in the world. And thanks to its passionate commitment to all of its moving parts, Gamera Guardian of the Universe remains one of the greatest successes in the kaiju genre and a fine accomplishment, period.